Good morning and welcome to BYU's fourth annual World Interfaith Harmony Week lecture. I'm Grant Underwood, Richard L. Evans Chair of Religious Understanding here at BYU. And it's my pleasure to greet you. Although you can't see each other, we are pleased to acknowledge the presence of members of the Richard L. Evans family, and we are especially grateful to the Richard L. Evans Foundation for its financial support in making lectures such as this possible. Also in our invisible audience this morning are members of the BYU administration, faculty and staff, and students. We're especially delighted to welcome you students. In a prior conversation, Dr. Wacker, our guest, expressed particular delight in the fact that a majority of his audience would be students. We welcome you. And we'll now hear from a student, Kaylin Lefevre, who is a senior in neuroscience, and also a native of South Africa. She will be offering the opening prayer, and it seems fitting because Reverend Graham visited South Africa a number of times in his global ministry. Kaylin, please. My dear Father, we're so thankful that we could meet together as a diverse group and that we could come together to strengthen our faith in, in our religions. And we are thankful that we can, during this process, learn to love each other even more and to find strength in each other's beliefs. Please help us to have thy spirit and blessing upon us while we discuss our religions. And um, please help all those in the congregation that they may feel comfortable and at home while we are in meeting and please help that especially those who are of minority religions that they may get the opportunity to share their beliefs and to feel empowered. We thank thee and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kaylin. I'll now introduce the rest of the program. We're especially pleased to have an official welcome from our academic vice president, uh, Dr. C. Shane Reese. He will be followed by the introduction of Dr. Wacker by Dr. Reed Nielsen, who is a long-standing friend and former student of Dr. Wacker, and who is now a president of the Washington, D.C. North Mission of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Following that introduction, we'll move immediately into Dr. Wacker's fourth annual lecture, World Interfaith Harmony Week lecture entitled, Aaron to the World, Billy Graham's Vision for a Global Gospel. So we'll begin now and proceed in that order, having Dr. Reese express the welcome from the university. Oh, thank you, Grant. And uh, I just want to, uh, to our students, to our members of the Evans family who are with us, to our guests from off campus, want to extend an official greeting from the administration at Brigham Young University. And, and uh, I'm just thrilled to have uh, you all here to join with us in, in a campus initiative that we all feel strongly about, and that is our interfaith harmony efforts that's led so well by, uh, by, by Grant, and, and I'm grateful for his work in pulling this together. We're especially delighted today to have uh, Grant Wacker with us, and we really look forward to uh, your address in, in a few moments. When I think of uh, interfaith and the, the notions of interfaith harmony, uh, which really are the, the impetus for us gathering together today, even if it be virtually. Um, I'm reminded of a, of, of a question that was posed to Joseph Smith by John Wentworth 
of the Chicago De Democrat. And uh, he asked about the basic tenets of the, of the beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in response to uh, Wentworth's question, Joseph Smith uh, sent back uh, 13 statements that adequately summarized uh, the beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, in particular, he talked about the, uh, uh, in what, what is one of my favorite articles of faith, as they've been called uh, in, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith says, we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allowing all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. And I think that talks about the importance of interfaith and the harmony that comes when we recognize the values, the commonality that we all share, the foundations really of the interfaith move movement as I've been exposed to it through in part the participation in this lecture series are that we have a mutual respect, mutual love, and that that breeds so much civility as we engage in conversations, not ignoring differences that exist, but embracing those and recognizing the, the real blessing that we have from understanding faith traditions of a broad group of individuals. And I think that's the spirit in which we gather today. So I am grateful for your participation, however it may be uh, in this virtual version of our fourth annual World Interfaith Harmony Week lecture and extend a special uh, welcome to our speaker today, Dr. Grant Wacker. Thank you. I appreciate this kind invitation by Dr. Underwood to participate in this wonderful lecture event. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and commend to you one of my dear mentors, Dr. Grant Wacker, from my graduate school days at the University of North Carolina and many courses at the Duke Divinity School. You need to know that before he was a Blue Devil academic, Dr. Wacker was a Tar Heel professor. Thankfully, we're both good friends and Christians and appreciate the good Lord's willingness to forgive a prodigal son who will someday hopefully return to wearing Carolina blue in addition to the robe, ring, and sandal described in the Gospel of Luke. I was reminded once again this past week before I was invited to introduce him for this lecture that Dr. Wacker is a remarkable community builder. As I gathered by Zoom with several dozen fellow graduate students at his invitation and hosting. You see, I graduated with my PhD in 2006, 15 years ago this spring. Yet each year, Dr. Wacker, continues to gather his formal doctoral students for an annual dessert night during an annual meeting of religious scholars. I continue to marvel at the kindness and interest he continues to manifest in my career, my family, and my personal life. Not only is he one of the most highly regarded professors of American Christianity, but he practices what he teaches and preaches as a disciple of Jesus Christ. He has inspired me now for two decades on being the best professional I can be, as well as the most authentic Christian possible. Educated at Stanford and Harvard universities, Dr. Wacker is the Gilbert T. Rowe Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Christian History at Duke Divinity School. He is the author of several award-winning books, including Heaven Below, Early Pentecostals in American Culture, America's Pastor, Billy Graham and the Shaping of a Nation, and One Soul at a Time, the story of Billy Graham. A former editor of church history, studies in Christianity and culture, and a former president of the American Society of Church History. He works on history of American evangelicalism, American Protestant thought, and the American missionary and interfaith impulse. His current project focuses on the history of the ideal of the virtue of humility in American life. A Methodist layman, Grandpa Wacker lives with his wife, Catherine, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Again, I express my love to him and gratitude as a former student of one who exemplifies 
this idea of building bridges instead of putting up walls among uh, their fellow religionists. This is a man of God and a man of the Academy. Dr. Wacker. Well, thank you, Reed. Um, that was an extraordinarily uh, kind uh, introduction and uh, I will remember that introduction uh, for the rest of my days, I, I guarantee. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to be here and honored uh, to, uh, to offer this lecture, uh, uh, albeit uh, virtually. This is a new one for me and I imagine uh, for most of you as uh, well. I want to begin with two uh, very short uh, qualifications. I always tell graduate students, uh, don't start a talk with qualifications. Well, in this case, I think, I think we, uh, we almost have to. I uh, have to explain that I had a mishap uh, with uh, my shoulder and so I have to wear this contraption and uh, I could not uh, you know, thread it through a uh, regular uh, suit coat. And so this explains my uh, dress down casual uh, garb today. Um, a second uh, opening uh, qualification is that I am aware of the uh, importance of the proper title of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, but in my talk today, uh, for the uh, sake of economy of expression, I will typically uh, speak of uh, Latter-day Saints or maybe even LDS, uh, but that's only uh, for economy of, ex of expression. I want to uh, thank my counterpart, uh, Grant Underwood. And I should tell you that Grant Underwood and I are probably uh, the only, only two well, they're the only two grants that I know in the American um, Religious History, Christian History Guild. I'm sure there are more, uh, but it's always been a, a special tie uh, between me and Grant Underwood, as well as with my great respect uh, for his scholarship and uh, his personal friendship. I have a long association with uh, Brigham Young uh, University, and um, I will... Uh, not go into great detail, but give you a little sense of my associations. As um, Reed mentioned, I am a United Methodist, uh, uh, an evangelical United Methodist. Uh, but for many years, I've had a deep appreciation for the uh, Latter-day Saint tradition. How did that come about? It didn't just fall from the sky. There are some concrete uh, historical reasons for that. And it started about 20 years ago when... Um, Two scholars by the name of Richard Mao and Bob Millett founded an ongoing dialogue called the Evangelical Mormon Dialogue. And it met every year, and it has met every year for about 20 years, sometimes at BYU, sometimes in Pasadena, some once at Harvard Divinity School. We, we meet in, in different places. But in the context of that dialogue, uh, we have come to know each other. Uh, both personally and theologically and culturally in so many ways. And in 20 years, I have come deeply to respect uh, my counterparts, uh, Bob Millett, a theologian at BYU, a uh, founding uh, figure, as well as Grant Underwood and J.B. Hawes, whom we will hear from a little later on, and Spencer Fluman, who was the director of the uh, Maxwell Institute. Now, I'll say that Spencer even threw caution to the wind and invited me to come out to BYU for the month of October. So I very, very much look, look forward to that. In the course of that 20 years or so of evangelical Mormon dialogue, academic appreciation uh, turned into something else. And that is deep appreciation for the depth faith that I encountered for the commitment uh, among Latter-day Saints to deploy their theology in concrete works of social justice. So besides the intellectual part, uh, my heart, and my emotions uh, have been captured in that dialogue. There's one more uh, ingredient I want to talk about, and actually this goes back to uh, Reed Nielsen. Uh, who so graciously introduced me. And I did not know that Reed was going to introduce me. Actually, I didn't know Reed would be any part of this today. It was all a surprise for me. But I wanted to tell you a story about Reed personally that explains a lot of my own relationship uh, with 
the tradition that the church, Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. 18 years ago, Reed was a first-year doctoral student at the University of North Carolina, and uh, he threw caution to the wind and came across the highway to take a seminar with uh, me uh, at Duke. And, um, and as it happens, in those days, he was just starting out as a fledgling academic. He didn't say a lot in class. He, he, he thought before he talked. Oh, that's a nice, nice virtue, right? Thought about things before he talked. All right. He sat toward the back. And uh, so in the course of a semester with 12 advanced doctoral students from all over Duke and UNC, I came to know him a little, not a great deal, uh, but just as one might know, uh, a, a student who is very, very diligent, very good, but I didn't know him a lot personally. Toward the end of the semester, my wife, uh, Catherine, uh, developed some heart problems, and I'll get way ahead of the story, and I'll tell you that she's fine now. But um, as it happened, she uh, had to have open heart surgery. And so I announced to the class one afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, that I probably would miss class the next Tuesday. And I said, the reason I'm in this class is my wife is having open heart surgery, and I'm sure I'll be with her during the class time. And um, so I'll miss class. That's all I said. The amount of time I took right now is the amount of time I spent in class. And I had to drove home. And there's this little box package on my front door. And it was a casserole. And I went up to this casserole and I saw a tag on it. It said, May God bless you. Pray for your wife's healing. Bob Reed, Jelly Nielsen. But when I went inside, I, I called Reed and I said, I don't know you all that well. Here is casserole sitting on my front door said, that's what we do. And I'll never forget. That. That's what we do. An extraordinary testimony to the strength and integrity, the, content, the tensile power of the Latter-day Saint tradition. I'd have to say that I have one more source of affection for Brigham Young, and uh, that is this my love for the Intermountain West. My wife, Catherine, says that the U.S. government should put a fence around the whole state of Utah and call it a national park. Well, more important for many American religious groups like the New England Puritans or South Carolina and Gullahs and the Intermountain Latter-day Saints, geographic territory is, is more than a tourist attraction. It's a semi- sacred, providential destination. You can't help but come into the Intermountain West, especially onto the campus of BYU, and not feel this sense of not only natural beauty, but providential destination. Well, time to get on to today's lecture. Uh, I'll speak for about 45 minutes. And uh, we'll follow that with the Q&A. And I want to tell you that I love Q&A. So if you can stay on, make a few notes and ask questions. I, I would love that because that's where I, that's the real payoff for me. That's where I learn a lot. Title again is Aaron to the World, Billy Graham's Vision for Global Gospel. And in the next now 40 minutes, I will seek to answer four questions, simple questions. First one is, who was Billy Graham? Second one is, what did he mean by the word gospel? Third question is, what did he mean by the word and the concept of a global vision? And the fourth question is, so what? 
I used to have a teacher in graduate school and after he'd give a paper or anybody give a paper, he'd sit back and those days professors would often light pipes and he'd light his pipe and billows of smoke would come up and he would say, so what? What difference does this make? Why do we want to know this? How does this change our lives? How does this make us better people? How does it change history? How does it make society better? So that'd be my fourth question is, so Okay, to the first question. Who was Billy Graham? And let me shoot to the end and offer an overall judgment. And the overall judgment is that uh, along with Pope John Paul II and Martin Luther King, Billy Graham was one of the three most influential Christian figures of the 20th century. Big statement, but I'm prepared to defend it. So let's ask, what are the components of this extraordinary influence that Graham exercised? Now I'm gonna approach this question in three ways. I wanna talk about narrative and statistics and then offer a few anecdotes. Okay, so let's begin with narrative. Just a narrative of the, so we say the mountaintops of a very long life. He was born on a farm near Charlotte, North Carolina in 1918. And shoot to the end, he died in 2018, just a few months shy of his 100th birthday. Growing up on this farm, he attended a rural school, small school, and I have to stress he was an ordinary kid. You know, very often when we're looking at luminous figures, we want to see a luminous past or sometimes a terrible past where there's a before and after. And this wasn't the case with Graham. He was just an ordinary kid growing up on a farm in North Carolina. He loved baseball. He loved fast cars. Uh, he loved, uh, well, as he, he was very free to say, he loved kissing girls uh, when he got old enough to do so. And nothing more than that. But I mean, he's pretty ordinary teenager. At average grades, not really bad grades and not really great grades, but average grades. His parents sent him off to fundamentalist colleges in the South. Later on, he transferred to Wheaton College outside of Chicago, which was very conservative, still is, but also it was an academically elite school, and it still is. And in many ways, that is the first place in Graham's life when he was in his early 20s, where he began to move into a very special circle, in this case, the elite educational environment of Wheaton College. On graduating from Wheaton College, he became an evangelist for Youth for Christ. You saw the photo on the poster where he's preaching for Youth for Christ. He became an evangelist around the nation and around Europe or Youth for Christ, but he was still relatively unknown through the 1940s. Big break came in 1949 at the end of the decade when he accepted an invitation to hold an eight-week revival in Los Angeles in what came to be known as the Canvas Cathedral, Great Kent, downtown Los Angeles. This eight-week revival won the attention of local journalists, including William Randolph Hearst, and this attention catapulted Graham into a national spotlight as a handsome, fast-talking preacher, a man who won many people the Christian faith by proclaiming that Christ was the answer, the only answer to the world's problems, to the nation's problems, and to individuals' problems. Christ is an answer, not an answer, the only answer to the problems that we experience in our lives. He proclaimed this with great fervor and great effectiveness. Well, in the course of the next 60 years, Graham set countless attendance records in his crusades, as they were called, and tents, and then municipal auditoriums, and then great coliseums, and some of the largest coliseums in the world. One attention for the friendships that he had with celebrities, with United States presidents, personal 
close relationships with United States presidents, especially four of them, were kings and queens and prime ministers and statesmen and stateswomen around the world. He won honorary degrees and prizes, including the prestigious Templeton Prize, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Congressional Gold Medal. I could go on and on. Uh, suffice to say that he is now one of only five persons and the only clergy person lies or would lie in honor in the U.S. Capitol building. I think it's very interesting to note that although he is a world traveler and received all this fame, he also counted his home, personal home, in a tiny little town near Asheville, North Carolina, tucked away in the mountains, Montreat, North Carolina. And it's, it's that contrast of this globe-trotting national, international celebrity, but his home was in this little town in the mountains of North Carolina. And there he died peacefully, as I said, just a few days shy of his 100th birthday, a few weeks shy of his 100th birthday in 2018. Well, that, those, that's a narration of the life events, the major life events. Let me offer a few statistics about his life. Now, statistics never tell you the whole story. In fact, it's very dangerous to get to let mislead to let statistics mislead us sometimes. But they are offer they do offer one avenue for appreciating the magnitude of a person's influence. Graham preached to seventy seven million people in fifty three countries over the course of his sixty year ministry. If we add live satellite feed, that number swells to 215 million people in 180 countries. Almost certainly more than any other person in history. What Graham himself would say was the most important statistic, though, was the number of people who came to Christ, who professed faith in Christ, commitment to Christ, conversion. And in his crusade, people signed cards to indicate their faith. And in the course of his life, more than 3 million cards were turned in. And he said, that's the most important register in my work. He appeared on the Gallup Register of Most Admired Men in the World 61 times between 1955 and 2018. 61 times, that's more than twice as often as any other person, the closest being Ronald Reagan at 31 times, Jimmy Carter, and John Paul II at 28 times each. I offer these statistics just to give a sense of the reach. We could go on. I would uh, just offer uh, one, one more, and that is in my own state of North Carolina, not long ago, just before Graham's death, uh, had a survey. Well, they took a survey of the citizens of North Carolina. And the, the magazine's called Our State. It's one of these really colorful, wonderful, you know, uh, mass-produced magazines about local color. And so they took a survey. Of who are the most admired men in the state? Well, by far, most admired men in the state was Billy Graham. You'll be interested to know, though, who was second. The ways down was Andy Griffith. And then a ways down was Dean Smith. This will please read great legendary basketball coach, University of North Carolina for many decades. Billy Graham, Andy Griffith, Dean Smith. This gives you a sense of, of local importance. I want to move from narrative to statistics to just a couple of anecdotes, okay? Uh, little stories, little tidbits that somehow capture the reach of his influence. One of the things that I did in researching my, my books on Graham is read the letters that people sent. My wife helped me and we spent uh, weeks reading these letters that people sent, of which there were millions. We didn't read millions, we read a small uh, sampling of them, of course, but one of the most uh, memorable, one of the most cherished parts for me were the children's letters. And among the jewels, the gems in the children's letters was one little guy, uh, first grader, who 
and as typical of children who ask for balloons and a book by Graham and, you know, this and that, and sign his name. And then there was little P.S. in a first grader's handwriting, maybe a second grader, I, I don't quite recall, but very young. But what I do remember is what was in the P.S. It was, tell Mr. Jesus hi for me. You think about that. Tell Mr. Jesus a sense in popular culture, obviously absurd in a way and theologically absurd, and yet a sense in the popular culture of his root. I won't say more about who Billy Graham was. I think that is um, enough. But I will add just this one comment. In, in addition to all of this praise and accolades, Graham also had many, many critics. And the criticism came from all angles. It came from the press, it came from politicians, from the church, from theologians, from ordinary people. In short, the critics were everywhere and they were large in number. Now they were always a minority. They came nowhere near the number of people who praised him one way or another, but they weren't insignificant. Very important Influential people were sharply critical of Graham's ministry, of his career. Uh, they were rarely, almost never critical of his personal life. And always his finances were above reproach. His, his personal uh, relationship with his wife, the integrity of well, all of those personal matters. I mean, they were above reproach. But it was the ministry. It was what he said, how he said it, and a lot of criticism. And sometimes even you receive death threats. Now, the reason I bring this up is because when a person attracts a lot of criticism from all sectors of the society, that tells you that person is pretty important, right? So let me summarize again and just say, along with John Paul II and Martin Luther King, I think without question, Graham was one of the three most influential religious figures of the 20th century. So that answers my first question. Who was Billy Graham? The second question was, what did Graham mean with the word gospel? I cannot tell you. I mean, how many times he used that word in the course of his life? Probably tens of thousands. There's no way of knowing. Gospel. What is gospel? What did he think of it? It's good news from the original Greek words. The gospel is good news. Good news. And notice, it's good and it's news captures us, okay? And what is that good news consist of? Well, that we all have sinned, but we're not lost in our sin, for Christ came to earth to die, to be resurrected from death, and offer forgiveness and everlasting life. In other words, Christ is the path to salvation in this life and in the life to come. And that's good news. There, there is a path to salvation. Now, Graham called this new birth. And wanted to stress the word new and birth. We use that word so often, we don't often think about the power of those words. It's new. It's a new light. And it's a reborn light. He didn't like the term born again, actually. You hear that all the time in the press, especially in the news. You know, different people are born. How many millions of born again people are there? He didn't like that term uh, because he thought it had been trivialized by overuse by media. But he wanted to say, in Christ, there is a new birth. Now, it's not only an individual new birth, but rather the new birth should manifests itself in a life of personal holiness and in works of social holiness. One has to show the reality and the power of that new birth. Now, it's important to say that Graham never relented in his insistence that personal rebirth preceded social rebirth. 
And there he had a lot of debates with a lot of other people, mainline Protestants in particular, who would, who would look to social reform as the primary calling of the church and of the Christian. And Graham said, no, the primary calling is the regeneration of the individual. And then from there, the regenerated individual could have regenerated hands and regenerated now, Graham believed a lot more than what I have just said theologically. He had ideas about how history will end and exactly how the atonement takes place. He had a lot of additional ideas. He wrote a lot of books or people helped him write books that expressed his own ideas. But those additional ideas were outside the central core gospel. Now, this I want to stress. There was a core, a core message. And the other ideas were, in a sense, many times negotiable, or if not negotiable, they were at least not priority. It's not where the emphasis should fall. So one more point I want to make about Graham's understanding of gospel, and that's this, is that he expected people, he called people, to make a cognitive decision to embrace that gospel, to invite Christ into your heart, to change your life, to Christ change your life. That resulted from a cognitive decision. Now, in the evangelical tradition, a lot of emphasis upon emotion and often accompanied with tears. And that's all fine. He said, that's all fine. That's not the heart of it. The heart of it is to make a decision for Christ. And you'll note, those of you who may know about Graham, that his magazine was called Decision. His national radio program, starting in 1950, was called Hour of Decision. His national television program, beginning in 1954, once again, Hour of Decision. He often said that when I preach, the core text, whether or not it is the text of the sermon that has been articulated for the evening, whether or not I have another text, the core text, the text that's always there yeah, in the background. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Every sermon ultimately came back to that text and so he expected people to make a decision about that text, up or down. He said every sermon requires a verdict, up or down, and that goes from the decision. That's the second question. What did he mean by gospel? Now I turn to the third, and for present purposes, I think most relevant question, and that is, what did he mean by a global gospel? And here I'll break that answer down into two parts. One is a theological globalism, and the second would be a geographical globalism. Theological globalism. In short, the gospel message is for everyone, everywhere. It's not a gospel for any particular group of people, such as Judaism for Jews. It's not for Americans specifically. It's not for white folks specifically. It's not for black folks specifically or any other racial or ethnic group. It's for everyone, everywhere. Now, if it's for everyone, everywhere, here we get to it critically important point. This means that all possible barriers to accepting that gospel must be removed. Keep the doors open. Keep the windows raised. Leave the gates ajar. One of his friends put it, Billy preached and called for I love this term, big tent evangelism with the flaps raised as high as possible. A big tent 
bring as many people as possible into that tent and keep the flaps high so that people can come into that tent. Now, it's important to say that doesn't mean that anything goes. There were standards. There was a core. This was not a kind of Hallmark card spirituality where everybody sits around a campfire and they join hands and they sing Kumbaya. It's not that by any means. There's a firm doctrinal core. There is a gospel at the core. But it's a streamlined gospel. And Graham wanted as many people as possible to be able to come in and to embrace this gospel and let it change their life. The governing aim, the overall governing aim of Graham's preaching was captured by the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, back in the 1890s. And William Booth said, keep the main thing the main thing. I love that. That summarized Graham's approach. Keep the main thing the main thing. Your eyes focused on what really counts. The other stuff's there, not unimportant, but keep your eyes focused on what really counts. Now, let me give you a concrete example. As the TV preachers say, let me share an example. Just one example of how this worked in real life. The most Famous and influential single event of Graham's long life took place in the summer of 1957. He held a 16-week evangelistic crusade at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Um, I was there, actually. I was only 12 years old. And what I remember of that is just the lines. I came from a little town in Missouri. And never before had I seen so many people in any one place and the lines and the aspiration and the music and it was it was very exciting a lot of people found it that way by the end of the 16 weeks there's some rather amazing we go back to statistic to statistics again some rather amazing statistics out of that crusade nearly two million people attended Graham's meetings in Madison Square Garden and elsewhere 400,000 more attended an overflow meetings out on the sidewalk loudspeakers. More than 60,000 decision cards were turned in. Remember I talked about that. People affirming their faith in Christ. Sign a decision card. Don't just affirm it. Don't have a warm feeling in your heart. Stand up. Come forward. Sign a decision card. Make it palpable. 1,500,000 letters streamed into Graham's headquarters in Minneapolis. Think about that. A million five hundred thousand letters as a result of this meeting. Now that's the size, the magnitude, the influence of that meeting. What does this have to do with global evangelism or theological globalism? What does it have to do with it? Is that Graham distinguished himself in New York for his determined effort to reach beyond the boundaries of white fundamentalism. The white fundamentalists, who until then had been his largest single constituency. And Graham was determined to reach beyond those boundaries. He saw them as artificial. And what he said over and over was, I will work with anyone who will work with me if they do not ask me to change my message. Now, he also said, if they accept the deity of Christ, and I think that's important, but he really did not, in practice, emphasize that part. It's not that he didn't think it's important, but that's not where the emphasis fell. Where the emphasis fell was, I will work with anyone who will work with me, as long as you don't ask me to change my message. So, if that is the hinge or the linchpin of Graham's New York Crusade, I'd say it's the linchpin of his global vision of the gospel. Who are the people he wanted to work with? Well, the Protestant mainline, both centrists and Protestant liberals, a remarkable number of people who are theologically liberal, came to work with Graham to herald that core gospel. 
streamlined gospel, but they still saw it as gospel. And they worked with him. And here it's worth noting that Graham invited Martin Luther King to speak to offer prayer one night. And historians rightly note the implications of King coming to the crusade because it suggests a, a, an attempt by Graham to associate himself with the civil rights movement and an attempt by King to associate himself with Graham's ministry. Uh, that in itself is a very complicated story. That was not, uh, that was an unsteady relationship. But the key point here that I wish to make is that King was theologically liberal. He was well to the left of Graham theologically. Graham still invited him. And King gave a stirring prayer that focused on the things they shared. Graham also worked with Roman Catholics, long the nemesis of evangelicals, Protestants, and so Again, work with me, I'll work with you. Francis Cardinal Spellman in New York was one of his dear friends and colleagues, really, in that project. He worked with the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. He said, they believe everything I believe, only more. He worked with Jews. He said, Jews and I disagree on the identity of the Messiah. Clearly, they can't come to Christ in the way that I am preaching it. But we agree on many other things. We agree, we agree on, on God. We agree on the authority of scripture. We agree on morality, patriotism, love of country. What about Latter-day Saints? What did he say there? Now, here we must proceed carefully. We need to be as careful and honest as I can. I don't know that he ever explicitly addressed the question of working with Latter-day Saints. However, and this is a very important however, two of his closest friends were George Romney, the, governor, uh, the father of Mitt Romney, who was governor of Michigan, and J. Willard Marriott at Marriott Hotels. In fact, J. Willard Marriott gave Graham a card that allowed him to stay for free whenever he wanted in any Marriott hotel in the world. And Graham was very proud. It's almost like a kid, you know, very proud of this card that Marriott had given him. Now, I think what's important here is not just these friendships, but rather the fact that Graham was so public about them. Wanted people to know that it, very important card-carrying foremans, as he called his friends, were his friends, and they could work together on many things. He did not like it when people talked about targeting any and evangelicals were long in the habit of trying to target Latter-day Saints to become evangelical. And they targeted other groups. And he didn't like that at all. He said, what I do is I preach the gospel. And I let the Lord do the rest. Now, I, I don't want to overstate this. There were deep theological differences between Graham and Latter-day Saints. But we felt that there was so much that they agreed on they could work together. Graham was never a universalist. He didn't say everyone is going to heaven. What he said was, I am called to preach the gospel and that I leave the rest to God. Well, there are a lot of evangelicals then and now who were willing to judge. You're going to make it and you're not. And uh, Graham never got into that. I preach the gospel. I walk the bridges that I can and I leave the rest to God. Geographic globalism. We talk about theological globalism. Let's talk about geographic globalism. I think that uh, in the long run, maybe 50 years from now, historians of Graham's ministry are going to say it was the global Graham that was more important than the United States and Canada Graham. In the course of his life, he preached in, he put his feet on, 50, on the ground in 53 countries. And if we go back to that live streaming, there were another 132 countries, so a total of 185 countries of the world. Nearly every nation recognized in the United Nations heard Graham at one point or another. 
almost half of the total number of crusades that he would preach were outside the United States and Canada. And we often lose sight of this. Graham was an international evangelist, always wanted to reach out, never satisfied, never satisfied to preach in North Carolina or the South or the United States or Canada, always reaching out to bring as many people as possible in. Now, there are several components of this, and I'll, I'll note these very briefly. For one thing, he orchestrated certain very important world conferences. He thought those were important because in those world conferences, he sought to bring Christians together from around the world to establish a fellowship of like-minded Christians. He felt it was important not to identify the gospel with any particular culture. And later in life, he went out of his way to say, I made this mistake when I was young of thinking God had somehow specially blessed the United States of America. And he said, that's not true. That is not true. The gospel is for every culture, every nation, everywhere. And he often said, it is a whole gospel for a whole world. He wanted to erase the distinction between missionary sending and missionary receiving nations. We are all in need. The gospel message. We all need to repent. He talked about evangelical penitence. We all need to repent of triumphalism. The sum of it is, is that in these multiple conferences Graham sponsored, he sought a multiracial, multicultural, multilinguistic awareness. Well, conferences are one thing. What about the Crusades? Well, let me talk about just one. The largest meeting of his career took place in Seoul, Korea in the summer of 1973. Five days, in five days, he preached to an aggregate audience of three million people, 72,000 decisions for Christ. The concluding service of that Korea crusade is particularly interesting. It took place on an airport tarmac on a Sunday afternoon, and aerial surveys show that more than 1,120,000 people jam themselves together under a broiling sun to listen to Graham Herald the Gospel. One of the iconic photos that, that I, I love in this research is of Graham. Well, the photo is, is taken from the back. And Graham is preaching, and as you look at this photo, there are people as far off into the horizon as you can see. Graham is preaching to them the gospel. What was his text that day? That's an interesting point, too. The text was John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. That was his text to what may have been the largest gathering of Christians ever. John Paul II may have, may have spoken to as many, but didn't probably preach in the same way. But we'll just say one of the largest gatherings of Christians in history. And that was his text. This brings us to the final question. And that is, what is the so what of this global vision? And it won't take me long here. One of my friends once said, the sweetest words at any lecture are two. And they are, in conclusion. Well, okay, in conclusion. In conclusion, I asked the so what question. Why do we know, need to know this? And here I make two points. The first is that yeah, Graham was a marble statue, but there were cracks in that statue. There were never cracks about personal morality, as I indicated, but rather the cracks were that he often was associated with some parts of American life that we don't like. Political power, associations with Richard Nixon, 
It was associated sometimes with middle class comforts, sometimes called the American way of life. It was associated with white privilege. They often called white supremacy. It was associated with all of these. Most of these problems he came to recognize as he grew older, especially as he grew into his 60s and 70s and 80s. He came to recognize and he repented sought to go another way. Not all, but many who sought to go another way. So that is one point. The so what? Don't romanticize. Be realistic. Be realistic. Graham made mistakes. There were cracks in the statue. Tried to fix them. The cracks were there. But the other point I wish to make is the mature Graham's expanding vision of the gospel offered to people and peoples everywhere a chance to renew their lives and their societies. Ram was a builder of bridges. He knew that those bridges were bridges. They crossed real divides. It wasn't like it were a direct road. It wasn't like it was a level playing field. A smooth, I say, a smooth playing field. No. These were bridges, bridges over real divides. Nonetheless, they are bridges. One can bridge. One can step over those divides. And so, Graham bore an errand to the world, an errand to proclaim a global gospel. For 60 years, he sought to serve as a builder of bridges. I will work with anyone who will work with me if they do not ask me to change my message. Here he serves as a model of Christian discipleship, Christian vision, Christian love for me. And I hope for each of you as well. Well, thank you. I have enjoyed talking with you today, and I would love to take questions. We are most grateful to you, Dr. Wacker, for this really fascinating, inspiring address. Inspiring not only because of the content, but because of your candor and honesty that gives us a, a truer picture rather than a romanticized portrait of Graham. Thank you so much. And hopefully that has rallied our audience to flood the Q&A channel with questions. And I'd like to just explain how we'll proceed at this point for those that can remain. For the students who have to go to class, we understand. Thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And we now will just comment on the procedure. If you have a question, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A icon. Click into it, type your question. We probably won't be able to get all of the questions presented, but we'll do our best. And to kind of control traffic and monitor and MC this portion, I'd like to introduce my friend, Dr. J.B. Haas, and he will be performing this task. Uh, Dr. Haas is a, the presently the Associate Dean of Religious Education at BYU and formerly was involved with Religious Education's Council of Religious Outreach, so he has keen interests in these matters. He's also a scholar in his own right of the time period that more or less overlaps with the latter portion of Graham's career and has written a prize-winning book published by Oxford University entitled The Mormon, the Mormon Image in the American Mind, 50 Years of Public Perception. So we're especially pleased to have Dr. Hawes uh, leading our uh, Q&A session. And I'm now going to pass the baton to Dr. Hawes, who will conduct our Q&A session. Once again, 
Thank you, Dr. Wacker, for an outstanding lecture. And to all of those who are remaining, if you love the lecture, you're going to love the Q&A. Dr. Haas, take it away. Thank you, Grant. And uh, I agree. I think we are going to love the Q&A. I also have to say um, that kind introduction, but I'm, I'm well qualified to control traffic. I grew up in Hooper, Utah. We currently have one four-way stop. So uh, that makes me well qualified for traffic control. <laughs> Um, but we, it, hopefully most of you have noted, thanks to this note from Adam Hellowell, that uh, our plan is if you're, if possible, to the default to have you ask your questions live. So note in your chat if you would prefer for me to read the questions. But um, let's, let's go with a, a great opening question from Professor Sean Hopkin, if, if you're there, Sean. And then we'll have uh, Professor Eric Eliason on deck. Sorry. I'm, I'm here. Sorry. Wow. That uh, we just had a really quick wig out uh, with my Zoom controls. Grant, it is so good to see you. Welcome to campus. What what a wonderful job with that lecture. It was uh, really excellent. Thank you, John. So, uh, great to see you. So my question is, is there a personal attribute or what what is it about um, Billy Graham's ministry that most draws you to him, that you most appreciate, or uh, that, that makes him the most likable for you? What, what would you say? Uh, uh, well, that's, that's, that's a great question. Uh, and I should tell the folks that Sean and I are part of the Evangelical Mormon Dialogue and we've been together for a lot of years there. Um, what I, I, I like about Graham is several things. Uh, number one, personal integrity. Uh, as I've said several times, there, were, there was no chink in the armor. And uh, Graham uh, felt that, uh, to use a, a, a much later image, that um, what, what happens in Las Vegas does not stay in Las Vegas. God sees it, and it inevitably has ramifications on your life. So I admire the personal integrity when he certainly could have uh, strayed in, in so many ways, and I appreciate that. Um, I uh, appreciate uh, his uh, uh, willingness to change. As I intimated near the end, there were cracks in the statue, and he tried to address them. He came to know about them. He tried to do something. He tried to become less associated with American partisan politics. Uh, he tried to advance uh, his understanding, his contribution to racial justice. Understanding that when he was young, that was, you know, he hadn't done that. And uh, he was a Southerner. And, and as he grew older, he knew that that was a deficiency in his life. And he, he tried to address that. He became a strong advocate of nuclear disarmament. And again, seeking to, to change and to address the problems around. So I, I would say the first thing is personal integrity. Uh, the second thing is a, is a willingness uh, to change. Um, but I'd also have to say that I, I was attracted by something you saw in the video at the beginning, and that's that electrifying presence in the pulpit. Uh, he was not an eloquent preacher, and he knew it, and his wife knew it, his friends knew it. He was, he was not eloquent like Martin Luther King, but he was effective. He knew what he wanted. He knew he wanted to draw people to make a decision for Christ, and I admire that effectiveness uh, What. Whatever the context, wherever he was, he would he would, he would strive uh, to uh, achieve that end of bringing people uh, to faith, and he did it with, with extraordinary skill. Uh, one biographer, who, a biographer who otherwise was not very sympathetic, but one but the, but the biographer said that Graham was the best in the world at what he did, and I think that, and uh, I admire. Thanks for that question, Sean. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Grant, for the answer. Eric Eliason, are are you on to answer? Ask your question live. Okay, I, I may jump in and ask Eric's question. Okay. Did you see the Did you see the depiction of Billy Graham's interaction with Queen Elizabeth on the Netflix series The Crown? How well did it capture what he was? <laughs> I love that question. Uh, first, Eric, what do you teach? You're a professor at BYU. Yeah, so I'll say for Eric that he is a professor. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, good, Eric. Sorry, Eric. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah, so I'm a I'm a folklorist in the in the English department. As a matter of fact, I, I owe you a long overdue thank you for over 20 years ago, the uh, 
press editor for one of my first books outed you as a peer reviewer with your permission, she said. And uh, your, your peer review was, was tough and insightful and, and very helpful. So oh. thanks if I've never said that in 20 years. But Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll appreciate that. Yeah, uh, yeah. It sounds like not everybody seen... thanks me for that. Uh, sometimes <laughs> I was, you know, not always right. Uh, well, Eric's wonderful question is, uh, it goes back to this, um, uh, is it um, uh, Prime or Netflix series, uh, The Crown? And I'd recommend that, incidentally. I think it's a terrific series. Um, but in uh, an early episode, it shows Graham uh, uh, sitting on a couch in a, in a cavernous stateroom, really. Uh, and on the, in another couch facing him is Queen Elizabeth. And, and uh, they're having a theological discussion. Well, there are two elements there. And that Graham had a long-standing principle that he would, as it was said, uh, not be alone with a woman outside his family, um, and he would not dine alone or uh, be in a room alone with a woman outside his family. And and, and on the and, and the point was a good one, uh, and that is um, avoid the appearance of evil, avoid temptation in the first place. All right, um, the press overstated it. And they took it to kind of, I say, fanatical ends. And so uh, a journalist immediately called me and said, so here we are. Here's Billy Graham in this room with a woman uh, by himself. And she's by herself. And isn't this violating his protocol? And I'm sure that if she'd asked him, uh, he would have laughed and he'd say, well, the rule is a common sense rule. All right. Now, use your common sense. Okay. So that was one issue that arose. It arose several times uh, in the press. All right. The other uh, was that um, uh, Graham had a, a, a theological discussion, uh, very brief theological discussion with the Queen. And I am not certain what the topic was. Uh, I think it had to do with, uh, do you remember, Eric, what the question was that they discussed, they batted between each other? Yeah, they, they had several interesting topics and they seemed to connect on the level of two Christian religious leaders. And she asked him his advice and she was quite, quite taken with him in, in the show. And it was interesting that, you know, from what you've said and others have said about Graham, it seemed to capture him pretty well that he was willing to work with people even from very you know different traditions and his evangelical background is different from you know her, her church of england background and particularly her position as head of that church was what what uh, was interesting and he yeah he was portrayed as a, a sound ad advice giver which you don't see on yeah. among christian leaders on television very much yeah. and it seemed a very pretty sophisticated handling of the of the nuances of various religious traditions and the show right. seems to do that as well but yeah I, I think that was the question was the that they were talking about was what is the role of leadership in Christianity particularly at somebody at the high strata that both of them occupied yeah um, well as I say my, my memory is a little foggy on the yeah. exact content but but my 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 thought was was that the way they portrayed Graham was fair the way they portrayed mm -hmm. the queen was fair and it was a, 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 a semi theological discussion which uh, well represented the Church of England and well represented got uh, uh, Graham's position he uh, as, as to the best of my knowledge I went to a little effort to find out how many occasions he uh, he interacted with the Queen, and there were 11, uh, may have been more, but um, at least 11 times, uh, he and the Queen either had um, dinner together and along with others, uh, or um, had uh, uh, you know, con con conversations uh, around, around the table, and he considered the Queen a friend. Now, of course, Graham thought everybody was his friend. Uh, this was his nature. I mean, everybody was his friend. And he had a lot of best friends, actually. Uh, it's one of his, uh, you might say, one of the cracks in the statue is uh, that everybody was his best friend. I, I'm exaggerating some, but uh, uh, he, he did perceive the queen as, as a friend. And obviously, she thought that he was a friend and she respected him as well. I should also say that he was also uh, friends with uh, um, Princess Margaret and with uh, Prince Philip. Uh, so the whole royal family.
Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Eric. Thank you, Grant. Um, I four students have have asked a pretty similar question, so I'll, I'll just I'll try to articulate that question, and then we can have next uh, T.J. Kennedy maybe be ready to ask your question, and then and then Tanner Garner. So here's here's the question that has come up four different uh, four different ways. But uh, what do you think about Billy Graham's uh, children, or or and and those in his family carrying on his legacy? How would you comment about what you see in similarities and differences um, in Billy Graham's family? Uh, every time I speak about Graham, as certain as the sunrise, someone asks a version of that question. And usually the question pinpoints Franklin Graham. All right. And uh, I don't want to go into a great deal of uh, detail here about this. Uh, and suffice to say that I, I think that uh, uh, Franklin Graham uh, does not represent the inclusiveness uh, that his father uh, represented. I should have to qualify that and say that Samaritan's Purse uh, certainly is inclusive in its social outreach. When there are tragedies and no questions asked, they distribute uh, aid as it comes. But in terms of, of theology and for that matter, politics, I think that Franklin has just gone down a different road. And toward the end of Billy's life, um, he was aware of that and he accepted it. Uh, uh, Lori Goodstein, a, a uh, journalist of the New York Times asked him about uh, Franklin's uh, uh, harsh views of Islam. And uh, Bill Lay said, well, and as I recall the conversation, he said, uh, I, I love my son, but on some things we disagree. And this is one of them. So Billy represented an ironic spirit as inclusive as possible, bring as many people into the tent as possible. And I, I see that Franklin has a, a very different approach. Uh, some would say it's a principled approach. Uh, uh, I will lay my cards on the table and say that my own heart lies with what uh, with Billy's uh, more inclusive approach. Um, other children, I uh, haven't had the kind of public visibility uh, and Graham Lotz as, as, a, as a ministry and uh, um, she's not ordained, but uh, very visible ministry. And uh, now that there's been a lot of controversy about the association of the Christian right with former President Trump, uh, this is a very interesting story in itself. Some of the grand, grand, grandchildren have come out strongly supporting Trump, and some of the grand, grandchildren have taken issue. And they have said not so much in opposition to Trump per se as to associate the pulpit. Uh, with Trump and say, look, you know, this is this partisanship is not part of the Christian message. You can have whatever views you want about, you know, the Panama Canal, but the Christian mission message transcends it. And 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 so some of the grandchildren have made uh, this uh, uh, very different uh, uh, articulation of, of the gospel. Wonderful. TJ, are you able to ask your question? TJ Kennedy? Oh, I'm sorry. Here. Oh, great, TJ. Yeah, this takes a lot of load. Uh, yeah. So I was just wondering how uh, how you would say Billy Graham would respond to like the current LGBTQ plus movement. Like he was seemed to be a very, you know, inclusive, friendly guy, but then he also had his standards uh, of what he felt was right and wrong. So how would he maybe respond or, or interact with people pushing for that movement today? Uh, uh First, TJ, introduce yourself to me. I, I wonder who I'm talking with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm just TJ Kennedy. I'm a, a senior here at Brigham University. Okay, I'm actually good. in economics, but nothing to economics. do with Yeah. Good. All right. I need to be in touch with you, actually, about my, my retirement plan. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and then it, you say uh, the, the gay lesbian question was that, did I hear you right? Yeah. How you would respond to that, to the movement? He did. Uh, uh, the, the issue arose in the late, later years of Graham's ministry, particularly, uh, I would say, from the mid uh, 80s onward. And um, this was very interesting in that he tried to combine uh, inclusiveness with standards. It's an excellent case study of, of the difficulty. It isn't always easy. In fact, it's rarely easy to be inclusive and, and keep certain standards. And so his view uh, was that uh, gay relationships are sin. Never back down from that. 
to the end of his, shall I say, his, his, his self-conscious ministry until he was getting quite elderly. Gay relationships uh, are, are sinful. Having said that, he went on also to say that he wanted the church to welcome them, to bring them into the fold, and he would say, they're welcome in my meetings. And at one point, a reporter asked him how he would respond if one of his children were gay. And he said, I would love them more because they would need it more. Now, this is in days in the 80s and 90s when uh, those of gay identity um, Felt more social program than today. And so this is what he's referring to, that there would be social pressure. And so they would need it more. That doesn't, you know, it doesn't resolve the question. He isn't going to say it's perfectly fine. He never, never went that way. But what he wanted to say and did say is we want to embrace gay people, children, in every way that we that we that we can without sanctioning um, uh, some practice, there are a lot of paradoxes in, in Graham's life. How do you how do you, how do you put together the paradox of him preaching that Christ is the only way to salvation, and then at the same time saying, "I'm not going to make any judgments. I leave that all to God." And he was pressed on that. And he said, "It's a paradox." And he said, "Yeah, now it is. Uh, both are true." And I think he would he would say the same about about uh, uh, the gay question you asked. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, TJ. I, I think we have Tanner Garner next. Uh, yeah. Great, Tanner. Okay. So Tanner, I like introduce yourself first. Right. Um, so I'm a student at BYU. I'm a junior. I'm just uh, studying in the, um, what is it called, world religions class here at BYU. And so we, we were challenged or invited to participate in this. Um, but I'm a, my, I myself am a music dance theater major here at BYU. Oh, um, but my question was, um, do you think it's possible for a similar figure to Billy Graham to arise today and like do you think the the cultural and religious bridges that Billy Graham built are they still alive and well today or have we become more divisive and how can we continue to maintain and continue to build more bridges across cultures and across religions today wow uh, wonderful que questions in the pearl. Uh, Tanner, Tanner, is that right? Yes. Um, those are uh, superb questions. Um, and that is, uh, let me take them in, in order first. Uh, no, I can't see any possibility of another Graham today. Um, and Graham was a product of his time. He's a product of the, 20, uh, the second half of the 20th century. And in all sorts of ways, uh, the media and his response to world, certain kinds of you know, threats worldwide, they were specific to his time. And I do not think we will ever see another Graham, not least because the kind of coalescence of uh, strengths that he had uh, are so rare. And then you put that into a different cultural context. So I think he's unique. And this is the time uh, to study him. Uh, same thing uh, with, uh, with uh, John Paul II and Martin Luther King. So that's my first answer. Uh, the answer to the second question is bridges. Boy. Wow, uh, that's a toughie. Um, I'll tell you what I hope, but I'll tell you what my rational mind tells me. Let's deal with the rational mind first. The rational mind is that uh, I do not see those bridges being built uh, anytime soon. Uh, the differences are so deep. Um, there might be sorties uh, reaching out, but I don't. I don't see real bridges now. I think we need to make a distinction here, though, between politics and faith. And the, Brit the, the chasms are more likely to persist in politics than in matters of faith. In matters of faith, I think we, we do see people working together in homeless shelters, 
uh, people of all political persuasions come together in homeless shelters. In my own town I lived in for many years until very recently is Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It was a wonderful homeless shelter. People coming together to work together. And I think that at that level, the hands-on level, uh, dealing with the crises right in front of our face, uh, there we are likely to see a great deal more coalescence and bridge building and, and a willingness to say, hey, hey, come on. Um, we've got more important things to do here. And our important things to do are here are to feed hungry stomachs and to heal um, uh, suffering bodies. Thanks, Tanner. And thanks, Grant. I think Thank we have. You. Thanks, Tanner. I think we have Marissa Kelly uh, queued up next for your question. Marissa? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Marissa? Yeah, um, I'm Marissa. I'm a freshman majoring in psychology. And then I originally had a question about Franklin Graham, but I had more specifically a question about like, how do you think that contemporary evangelists compare to Billy Graham? Like for example, Joel Osteen. Uh, well, are we? Well, hi, Marissa. Um, and uh, did you want to ask about Franklin, or just set that aside now and go to the other uh, evangelists? I think I was included in one of the four people that you already answered the question for. Okay, so okay, well, all right. Um, I don't see uh, very many commonalities between Graham and other evangelists. Certainly not Joel Osteen. Uh, Graham was never a proponent of uh, prosperity gospel. He never came close to that. Uh, in fact, um, uh, sociologists have analyzed the amount of time uh, he devoted in his sermons and on his radio and TV broadcast to fundraising. And uh, he devoted, he, not the least, but he was among those who devoted the least amount of time to the question of money. And uh, uh, it just, you know, the, his, his associate Cliff Barrows would simply say, uh, send us, you, say, you know, pray for us and send us your support and, you know, and let it go at that. So money was not paramount uh, in his ministry. He never preached anything close to a prosperity gospel of saying, you know, that you, you can't, out, like Earl Roberts said, you can't outgive God, all right? Uh, pressed down, shaken together and running over, you know, all, all, all these, all this jargon in the prosperity gospel. Uh, Graham never got close to that. He didn't believe it. And so uh, he never got close to that. So, no, I, I see uh, no parallels at all between him and prosperity preachers. Uh, what about other evangelists? Um, I see none. I mean, I just don't see them out there. Uh, uh, you know, there are people who uh, re I don't need to name names who have recently uh, come into uh, uh, under a significant shadow about you know, moral integrity and other kinds of integrity. I, I, I don't see that. I don't see anybody else with that kind of charisma. Um, interestingly, I do see it in some political figures. Uh, and, uh, and I actually wrote about this in Barack Obama and uh, Obama's uh, funeral address at the Charleston shooting uh, four years ago. Uh, and was it for um, uh, pastor and representative uh, uh, Charles Pinckney, as I, I recall, as I recall the name. And Obama gave the funeral address and he broke into song, singing himself amaz "Amazing Grace." And that that was that was a powerful testimonial in itself. So I, I think certain kinds of political figures might have certain kinds of impacts, uh, but they're episodic. There's nobody with that kind of uh, sustained uh, vision and presence of Grand did. Thanks, Marissa. Grant, I, I was thinking about one episode in Billy Graham's life that, that maybe uh, ties together some of the threads of your, your lecture, uh, criticism, bridge building. Do you want to say something about his trip to the Soviet Union in 84, in Moscow in 84? What, what strikes you about that trip? Oh, JB, uh, what's your home address? I want to send you a check. Um, that's, uh, that's one of my favorite questions. Uh, I mean, because obviously I, I admire Graham. I, I recognize the flaws in his life and his ministry. Uh, but I, I admire him on the whole. 
and I think that uh, the moral apex of his career was his trip to the Soviet Union in 1982. And uh, let me say what he did, and then I'll say quickly why I think that represents a kind of moral apex. He went to the Soviet Union to a conference on uh, nuclear disarmament. It was an extremely controversial conference. Um, and uh, I don't need to go into those details right now. Suffice to say, he went to this conference in 1982 and he made a strenuous plea for nuclear disarmament by the United States and by the Soviet Union, as it was called then, and uh, by all other countries that were coming to possess nuclear arms. And he said, I, what I hope for ultimately is total military disarmament. But he said, right now, let's, let's just start with what's happening right now. And then he went on to the incredibly memorable and powerful lines that he said, right now, the Soviet Union and the United States are like two little boys standing in a bathtub filled with gasoline playing with matches. And what those two little boys are about to do is to blow up themselves in the house. And Graham says, we, the United States and the Soviet Union, are on the precipice of destroying civilization as we know it. But what are we going to do about it? Well, we're going to scale back mutually assured disarmament. Now, that's what he said. Uh, why is that uh, important right now? That seems like, you know, an order of fate. I mean, pretty passe. That's important because in 1982, it took a great deal of courage, enormous amount of courage, to call for any kind of disarmament in the face of what was perceived as spiraling uh, armaments uh, by the Soviets. And uh, Graham received uh, fierce criticism uh, for going. His wife opposed it. His own wife, long, very close marriage, wonderful marriage. His wife opposes going. His close associate, his board opposed it. Uh, President of the United States uh, initially opposed it, later, later relented. American ambassador to the Soviet Union uh, sharply opposed it. Everybody opposed it. Um, uh, he felt that he was called. He had a prophetic mission to go over there and to say it. When he came back, he received criticism, um, even from conservatives. George Will, a uh, columnist of the Washington Post, uh, said Billy Graham is America's most embarrassing export. Pretty pungent. Um, so he was attacked before he went. He was attacked when he came home. I'll conclude this by saying that one of the people who attacked him at the time was Dan Rather, a newscaster. Thirteen years later, I know it's 13 because I looked it up recently. 13 years later, Dan Rather went public. And he said, Billy was right. And I was wrong. Now that says a lot about Rather as a man, his own courage, his own willingness to you know, confront a mistake that he had made, a mistake of judgment. But it is to say that I think this, this is one of the moral high points. Now, I don't want to you know, romanticize. Billy made some serious mistakes in the course of his life. We can talk about them if you want to. It was by no means a perfect track record. But this, I think, is one incident in which um, he exhibited extraordinary uh, courage, and he turned out to be right. Powerful answer. Thanks, Grant. I, as we're looking at the clock, I think we're at our last question, uh, and this is from a, um, from Sam Johnson, who's asked me to read it for for him. I think this is maybe a, a nice a concluding note. Thank you so much for the lecture, Dr. Wacker. You talked about Billy Graham talking about the importance of making a cognitive decision to follow Christ. Are there any accounts of how and when Billy Graham made that decision for himself? <laughs> it's a wonderful question. Who asked the question? Let me hear hear that. Sam Johnson, uh, a, a student. Sam Johnson. Okay, it's a wonderful question. Um, actually, the interesting thing is, is that I don't really see a point in Graham's life when he made such a decision. It seemed to me um, that, as one American theologian of the 19th century put it, he grew up understanding himself to be a Christian and never imagined himself otherwise. Now, 
There are a lot of people who will write about different kinds of uh, moments of, uh, of uh, what I would call them closure moments, the times when he, uh, you know, in the literature or the hagiography said, well, Graham suddenly made this, this deep commitment to Christ that he hadn't had before. I don't see it that way. To me, a man had, you know, he grew up in a conservative Christian home. He remained Christian, all of his assumptions and his aspirations. There were times of closure when those uh, Christian aspirations were sharpened and tightened and he embraced them. Uh, but the fun fundamental point is that this is pretty much where he always was. Same thing with his wife. And uh, a side note is that we have good evidence that the almost certainly the majority of people who signed decision cards in his meetings uh, were also Christians already, but they, they were people who had strayed, had grown cold, they had lapsed. And so what we see is a reaffirmation of really who they are. And sometimes, you know, Graham would say, well, so what? I mean, coming from nothing or coming from a, a faith grown cold, the point is to embrace that faith to make something of it and to do that. I'm making a decision, a self-conscious decision, uh, that I'm going to stand up and that I'm going to walk the, the life of a Christian. Thanks, Grant. Well said. This has been delightful. All right. Well, it's wonderful, Grant, to have you respond. I think the audience can imagine that we could go for hours. This is a, an almost inexhaustible subject from a scholar who has inexhaustible knowledge of that subject. Um, as the host, though, I'm going to take uh, the opportunity to ask you a kind of final question. Thinking about your work coming up on the uh, virtue of humility, uh, and then thinking about the question that was asked and so important to us in this lecture series about building bridges. Um, I wonder if you could comment on the importance of mending bridges by humility, by exercising humility, and perhaps reflect on the episode where the conversations, the snippets of conversations with Richard Nixon that were captured on tape decades later were revealed and how Graham handled that. And do you see that as a demonstration of his humility and his desire to mend and repair bridges to keep them as they should be? Oh, Grant, I mean, this. Fabulous question. Um, I, I need your home address too, um, because I mean, it, it, it goes to so many fundamental and important issues. First, I'll say that uh, I, th I think Billy was a, a deeply humble man at the same time. Uh, he, he experienced tremendous ambition for himself. There was this kind of paradox in him. There was a tension, a man who who knew that he was called by God and all the gifts came from God and not, they were not his own. And yet, there was, uh, you know, there was ego. There, there was uh, this ambition to succeed and do well. He would say, I'm doing well for God. But as also, there's a little bit of doing well for himself, too. And not just a little bit, a lot of doing well for himself. So we see all these paradoxes in, in Graham's life. And this is one of them, this, 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 this war. But he certainly sought to make humility the ideal for the Christian. And at a very personal level, uh, I think that certainly was true. Deeply, deeply humble man. Um, what Grant is referring to, uh, put it very succinctly, is that in uh, 1972, uh, Nick, uh, Graham was in uh, the Oval, Oval Office with Richard Nixon and H.R. Haldeman. And there's a third person whose name I, I have forgotten. And uh, uh, Nixon launched into an attack on Jews and the media. And uh, he said that uh, uh, Jews had a stranglehold on the media. And, uh, and Graham, uh, the, the tape recording shows Graham agreeing with Nixon. 
And he goes on to make a horrible comment uh, in which he, uh, he says, uh, uh, many Jews are my best friends, but they don't know how I feel about them. And the context is they don't know how I feel about what they are doing uh, to uh, the country uh, through um, uh, to the media. Now, the last few words there, I'm extrapolating, but I think that's the context that suggests is, is, yes, uh, what his meaning, meaning was. Uh, however, Pars, it was an egregious uh, comment. And um, uh, at the time, he, you know, he made nothing of it. Uh, exactly uh, 30 years later, the White House tapes are revealed, and here's Graham on tape. Comes out in 2002. Here's Graham on tape. Initially, he denied the conversation. He said, I didn't do that. Uh, I mean, he was so outrageous and so awful. He said, I didn't say that. Sentence. After a while, he, he, he was shown. He was persuaded. After a while, I mean, after a couple of days, he was persuaded that he did, in fact, make those comments uh, to Richard Nixon. Um, what came of that, and this goes right back to Grant's comment about mending broken bridges, what came of it was that uh, he apologized abjectly and profusely. He did not try to spin it. And there were others in the Graham organization who tried to spin it and said, well, what Billy really meant was this or that. He didn't do that. He went right to the heart of it. And, and he said, I did wrong. I did wrong. And I cannot excuse it. Uh, at one point on Larry King's show, he addressed this. Larry King was a self-professed secular Jew. And uh, so King asked Graham about this episode. And Graham said, well, he said, I was rolling along with the president of the United States and I did not stand up to him. And Larry King said, that's not good enough, Billy. Billy, no more to say. It's just not good enough. You're rolling along with the president. No more to say except to apologize. But there's one final episode of this that's important, and that is in uh, June of 2002, uh, Graham was holding a, a uh, crusade, one of his last, in Cincinnati. And Cincinnati is the site of Hebrew Union University. And uh, he met with a delegation of rabbis. And as the story goes, um, an eyewitness to the story recounts it as follows is that Graham came into the room and uh, the rabbi stood as he came in and he said, uh, no, 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 no. He said, sit down. Uh, he said, I am the one who should be on my knees begging for forgiveness. And again, as the story goes, the rabbis clapped. What I think that shows is both Graham's humility and it also shows the rabbi's humility. Their willingness to acknowledge that uh, a great man had made a great mistake, but he was also willing to come to terms with it. And they too were willing to offer forgiveness. So I find it a, a, a poignant moment, but to go back to uh, the other Grant's comments about humility, it, it seemed to me that there was a lot of humility all around them, uh, the awareness of, of that one had done wrong, and then a willingness to forgive that wrong that they saw. Well, a wonderful message uh, epitomized by a real genuine human who both builds bridges and has to mend bridges as we all do. And Mending. that is a great takeaway for our fourth annual World Interfaith Harmony Week lecture. You know, Grant, that would be a great book title right there, Mending Bridges. You, you and I should co-author a book called Mending Bridges. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. I am sure the audience joins me in deep appreciation for a wonderful time together and wishing we had a lot more. So yeah, thank you. Appreciate and thank it. you to you in the audience for being here and showing your interest in this vital subject. Wishing you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again for joining us and good day. Okay.